if anything happens to like your mic's connection, it will stop recording. Right. Um, and I am infamous for slapping my own microphone. <laughs> uh, so I will get fired up in a discussion, slap the shit out of my own microphone, uh, and then cause it to come unplugged. Amazing. Uh, which will end audacity, the audacity because it's recording. Because like, it's like, uh, no microphone, I'm done. I yep. guess we're over now. I guess, I guess we're done. <laughs> and so I will occasionally look at it and realize that my having slapped the mic has caused the recording to stop. Monica, the slapper of microphones. <laughs> <laughs> the slayer of audacity. <laughs> everybody welcome to a new bonus experience series i don't know if i love the way that sounds margaret will work on it <laughs> friend of the show and repeat guest daniel lozon has signed on with us to do a eh, however many episode we feel like series where the two of us go deep on one mechanical topic deep deep it's, deep. An, it's an italics on my on my script <laughs> come on man <laughs> As always, we are two queer women speaking with authority about games. Uh, and yes, we will still swear. So if you have a problem with that, you can still go die. Die mad about it. Die mad about it. Yes, correct. <laughs> Please go and die and be mad about it while you do it. <laughs> I'm Monica. I'm Danielle. Yeah, I'm DXP's <laughs> regular host, Exalted Essence Mechanical Developer, in case you're tired of me saying that in every episode. Uh, and regular freelancer for the onyx path you want to list you want to flex on some of your cred here oh man i'm danielle <laughs> i'm a regular freelance developer and designer for onyx path publishing i am a freelance author for several other game companies uh, and i i write games and you i do. spend all day thinking about games that's, that's your job it's literally that's your my whole job, job. That's my whole existence, that and cleaning the house. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my job is feeding this fat cat that I have named oh, yeah. Leo. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also have a fat cat who's my responsibility to feed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next time, <laughs> fat cats. Yeah, why we love them. A deep discussion on deep. fat cats. <laughs> fat cats and why we love them. We pretty much have to say deep that way every day. Deep. deep. <laughs> hey. So both Terry and Rob are really fond of catching the weird chaotic shit I say out of context and then turning it into a sound bite and then oh. sending it to me. Oh, yeah. I have several hilarious <laughs> sound bites from both of them. <laughs> So Julia has started to play this game in real life where she stops me in the middle of conversation and goes, that's the thing Terry would turn into a soundbite. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so good. Uh, so today our deep discussion <laughs> is we're going to we're going to talk a lot about uh, social system mechanics. And using things to direct conversation and like really focusing on that because I played Bluebeard's Bride recently. Yes. Yeah. Which is a really good game. It's it's perfect for the Halloween season. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. See, I, I think I wanna start off by talking about Bluebeard's Bride and what I thought it was and what I what I got. <laughs> like that yes. that meme that's like what I thought, what I expected, what I got. Like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right, let's do it. So I really, I actually thought it would kind of be more depressing. Oh, you have the physical. Oh, it's such a fucking gorgeous book. I'm, I'm just, let's Look just moon it. over this God, book that no so one else beautiful. can see but us. Right. Yeah. It's I gorgeous. mean, our, for our audience at home, you do owe it to yourself to buy a hard copy because it's gorgeous. It is gorgeous. It's, I'm going to say this, and I just recently bought Merkborg, which you probably heard <sighs> me talking about. I want a copy of Merkborg too. It, this is probably the most visually stunning, beautiful book I have ever put on my bookshelf in any way, shape, or form. Uh, Bluebeard's Bride is beautiful. Merkborg is stylish. 
Yes. Morkborg yes. is sexy, stylish. It's, you know, looks like a, a, you know, metal album cover. Bluebeard's Bride is like stunning. And even while you read it, you're like, oh man, this is just beautiful. <laughs> like every image is evocative. Even the layout is, I mean, it's masterful. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Maybe I might yeah. like gush over how much I love <laughs> Bluebeard's Bride. Uh, but I'm going to let Monica talk about what she thought she was yeah, getting. Yeah. So I thought it was going to be like the way people describe it. I thought it was going to be a lot more depressing. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. cause it does seem pretty bleak. Like yeah. the elevator pitch is pretty bleak um, where you're like, yeah, you play the wife of a serial killer and your only way to, to win is to die. And they're like, if like if you put it that way it sounds kind of <laughs> terrible and so like that was that was really kind of the rundown that i had gotten and i was sort of like i don't know that i want to buy into that that sounds a little awful but i'm sure it's for someone probably not for me and then Chaz was like hey do you want to play in an actual play that we're going to do for like a for um the story told and i almost said no but i was like you know what don't be a fucking coward just do it find out if you dislike don't it you never coward. have to play it again right like <laughs> if if I play this game and I don't enjoy it, well, then I won't buy it. <laughs> right? I will continue yeah, to just, not own it. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's no, like, there's no better way to give it a try than with, like, some people you know and, like, for free, which is what I got to do. And that was, it was a really good time. Like, uh, someone was like, I think this is my new favorite RPG, and I'm not sure I'm going to give it that, that quality, but it was excellent. So I was pleasantly surprised to discover that it isn't sort of a misery tourism type thing, but it is in fact perfectly tuned to tell a ghost story. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know if you know like the story that it's based on. The I, I do sort of. Yeah. Okay. So the but the Bluebeard story is a ghost story yeah. in at in its essence. It's a very gothic horror style ghost story, though, right? Yeah. And when I say gothic horror, I will talk a lot about how like. Vampire the Masquerade is gothic horror, but mm -hmm. this is what I really mean by gothic horror. You know, it's the, what was that new movie that just came out? Something, Crimson Peak. Yes. You know, gothic horror is described as a genre where the horror comes from this kind of, like, very personal, but like the things that people do to each other. And right. you are haunted by the the remnants of usually, like, dead wives or dead relatives or dead like other people that have been wronged by yeah. someone in the story and the, the gothic horror of it is this kind of internal you know maybe everybody in the story isn't a good person and usually the person the story is being told from the innocent's point of view the innocent learns about the horrible choice that they've made by buying into this horrible person and hear all the dead people coming <laughs> to essentially try to save this innocent person right. by haunting them and scaring them away. And then usually they went, end up like dying <laughs> because <laughs> gothic horror does not end necessarily well. Right. But, but it's beautiful. It's, it's often very beautiful and very personal. And so, you know, the story of Bluebeard is, you know, he, this woman marries this man. He, you know, he's married a bunch of women. He's very rich. She is poverty stricken her she's marrying him to uh to help out her family because he's got this large dowry he's going to pay to her family uh and then when she gets there she is given free reign of the house to wander around and look through the house except for one room that is forbidden to her she cannot resist the temptation she looks in the room she finds out he's a serial murderer and then he kills her for finding out his secret which is very gothic like yes. that like, <laughs> right and, you know, it's that forbidden knowledge. It's that, you know, and some of it is, is like, you know, what has she got herself into? And and how innocent is she truly for having, you know, everybody knew that this guy had like 10 wives and they all disappeared mysteriously and nobody <laughs> once thought that maybe he was fucking murdering them? <laughs> or did you think that and then go, but the money was more important? Right. Right. So, you know, there there's some things to think about there of like, what is the lesson from this story? Right. So and so in for the people who are listening to this who may not who may have only gotten the bad elevator pitch that I got. Sure. <laughs> um so in this game, you and all the people who are playing are playing like aspects of the bride's psyche. And so the f three to five of you are like basically the own conversation that happens in your own head when you're dealing with a tense situation. And they all are sort of reflective of 
the way society treats women. Mm-hmm. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, they are. And I, my favorite thing is that you're, each of these members' uh, characters are, are called sisters. Yes. So you're not, you're not shards of a psyche or anything. Right. You're, you're, their, you know, you're this person's internal monologue, but they're all each other's sisters, which is such an interesting thing because it, it defines a dynamic between them immediately. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. When you think about how do you treat your sister, how do you feel about your sister, right? Uh, Even if you don't have any siblings, you can think about that kind of sibling familial love of like, you don't always agree with them, but you, you know, you you may not even get along with them, but they're still your family and they're still close to you. You don't necessarily need to have the same personality. You don't need to necessarily feel the same way about everything you see. And it's such a great way to describe the dynamic between these parts of the psyche because they're all part of the same woman, but they, they have that kind of familial relationship where it's. I don't necessarily agree with your assessment right now, sis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so each, there's each, each one is basically a playbook done in the PBTA style. Yes. It's really condensed down because yes. Bluebird's Bite is so focused. And that's kind of one of the things we want to talk about mechanically in this deep dive. <laughs> and then each one of you describes a physical aspect of the person who you all are. Like uh, the witch gets to describe her hair. The fatale is her mouth. The animus is her hands. I'm not looking at this. I'm doing this from memory. <laughs> Danielle has the book no, in front of I'm her. I'm looking at their moves right now and not the playbooks themselves. Yeah. Uh, anyway, you, uh, someone else is the eyes. Someone's the body. And like they all have. And then like like all PBTA games, you have questions you answer. And the 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 groundskeeper, which is the name for the GM or the facilitator in this game, in the game that I played, added extra questions that she made up on the fly and they were all really good stingers. Uh, So I can't wait for this episode to come out and for you all to hear the extra things she asked because they really helped set the tone. Like the person who ran this game blew it out of the fucking water. Yeah. I was very impressed. And so I played the witch, which I thought sounded at first like maybe would, would get a little bit supernatural, but I like read through the moves and stuff and I was like, actually, this is, this is sort of reflective of like being the part of your brain that sort of goes against that transgresses against like what society expects of a woman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so when we were playing this game, when everybody else, like one of the questions all of you have to answer when you're doing this thing that that also is a mechanic that sets the tone for this gothic horror game is that everybody has to answer from the aspect from the point of view of their aspect. Do you trust your husband? Like, do you think he's just a he's a good guy who's maligned by these vicious rumors? Or is he, in fact, awful? And everybody else was like, yes, we trust him. They're just being mean. (laughs) And I was like, no, (laughs) blue is sus. (laughs) <laughs> amazing i like I, I also really had to control my desire to crack wise because i didn't want to break the scary tension yes <laughs> and i leaned into this whole like the witch is like her 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 desire for being like a like a man in air quotes like wanting to learn and wanting to make money and wanting to have financial independence and like that maybe the bride could have actually had a chance at real freedom through, you know, financial savvy because she had some skill at being a merchant and maybe she could have been like a wife of bath figure. But nope, we're here now. So yeah. so my answer was basically like, no, he's he's sketch as fuck. <laughs> nope, you don't offer an open ended deal like that. Much like if something is free, you're <laughs> you're the product. So right. and right. I thought that was like a real fun way to approach that. But yeah, so like those questions open up that kind of interpretation and immediately focus the conversation of the game towards this story that we're going to tell. And I really would like to talk about how this game is a fucking masterclass in how dice rolls do not need to be involved in good mechanics. Yes, absolutely. So let's let's talk about the the things that Bluebeard Brides does in my opinion that make this about a, a, a telling a ghost story, right? Yeah. And like, essentially, this game is so focused. And something I think, you know, 
Powered by the Apocalypse, a lot of people talk about Powered by the Apocalypse. It's a, it's a great system, blah, blah, blah. But I think what Powered by the Apocalypse's biggest, like, hallmark, its biggest strength is that it is really good at driving down and narrowing down to a very focused game. Yes. In which you you pick specific moves, you pick specific aspects, you pick specific things, all to tell a very, very narrow and specific story. And so if your game is narrow and specific, Powered by the Apocalypse as a system is a really great framework to hinge that on. And, you know, I would even call Bluebeard's Bride is Powered by the Apocalypse, but it's so Powered by the Apocalypse light. Yes, it's super light. Because it's because it is really about telling a collaborative ghost story. It is everybody sits around the table and we're telling this very specific ghost story and we're telling it together and it's got some rules on how to dictate that conversation, but really it is constantly a conversation. Yeah. So this goes back to something I have shaken my fist about in other episodes. Um, I, I think it was in the Mechanics Are Inevitable episode, which pause, go listen to it, come back now that you're back. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Where I say that, like, if I write a rule that directs how conversation happens, that is still a mechanic, even if we're not rolling dice. Like, I see a lot of Twitter discourse where folks are like, my game is about kissing and it doesn't have any mechanics. And I'm like, well, if you told me how I'm supposed to interact with my other players about how we get around to the kissing, then your That's game sure as fuck has a mechanic. Yes. Like, <laughs> and so I, I want to talk about this because. Bluebeard's Bride has mechanics. It has mm -hmm. plenty of them. Mm -hmm. They are just focused on directing conversation. Right. And there is some rolling. There in, is in, some rolling. I mean, there's some rolling with some of the moves, but even those rolls, the the random chance or whatever, isn't uh it's just it's interesting because they're it it's to to see whether or not you succeed, uh, which a lot of games roll that way, but a lot of it is just to kind of find out what happens. And not like in a succeed, don't succeed kind of way. Uh, and I will, uh, I, you know, lots of lots of Power by the Apocalypse does that already, right? You know, like yeah. sometimes when you're rolling, it's not because you're like, oh, did I hit? And it's like, you know, you did. It's to see how well or, or really what happens because you took this action. And I think a lot of the rolling in Bluebeard's Bride is made that way. Like, what is the result of the thing that you did? You're not going to fail to do the thing ever. Mm-hmm. You're, it's just, we're just rolling to see what the results are. Yeah, I think Which the, is, the things you roll for, because I have a I have a little printout of mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. moves, because I was trying not to be that player who's like, oh, I don't know what's going on in the AP, so I printed off everything. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I'm courteous, but not always. Yeah. Um, you roll to caress a horror, which is something that can, in fact, go horribly wrong. You roll to cry out for help and dirty yourself with violence, and the rest are all just conversation right and even the individual playbook moves are all conversational uh i don't think any of those are rolled i'm not sure but uh, the witches sure aren't but i didn't print out the rest of them yeah i'm looking at them online right now because yeah. like as per most <laughs> so anyway you know i want to talk about a, two specific moves in bluebeard's bride that i think are just masterful go for it the first one is propose a truth Okay. And this is a, uh, it's an exit move. Let's take a brief aside and talk about what that means. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there's three types of generic moves that you can make in this game. There are maiden moves, which literally anyone can take at any time during the game table to, they often either deal with how you're in investigating the room that you're in or deal with each other. So you can care for somebody in the room or one of the other characters or whatever you can there's other things that you can do but maiden moves can be done at any time by anyone there are ring moves so the game has a ring which is the wedding ring and whoever is in control of the ring at the time can make ring moves and one of the ring moves is to give up the ring and hand it off to somebody else uh, so you can always make a move to just pass the ring on to, to one of the other you know sisters and let them make a ring move instead and whoever's holding the ring is the the face at the moment of the bride as she is investigating or whatever. And then exit moves are moves that happen, and I may get this wrong, but they're the end of game moves, kind of. Basically, you you explore through 
the I'll pick it up from here. I have sure. it in front of me. So uh, yeah, yeah. Y- y- you explore through the house because the whole thing is that like, or um, the the person who ran our game. I don't know if this is the a house rule or just their take on it was the ring is the ring of keys because you're exploring the house. Yeah, it can um, be that. Yeah, as well. th- that's how we played it in our game. So yeah, which I thought was very thematic, but whatever. So like the mm-hmm. ring is the mechanic to control who's leading the conversation, and we'll we'll get into that more in a bit. But you're exploring through this house and you're supposed to basically like look through a bunch of rooms before you get to the last room, which is, of course, where the game ends. And I suppose that depending on how much time you have to play, there can be an indefinite number of rooms until you get to the end. But whenever you enter a room, you have to contend with its horrors and whatever other creepy stuff is in there. And so like it's basically a spook after a spook after a spook and then it has an ending. At any time you want to leave a haunted room and pro tip they're all haunted you have right. to make an exit move exit move right <laughs> uh, right so okay propose the truth right so there's only two exit moves to leave a room you can either just escape blip, 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 i'm gone i ran away it was scary or you can propose a truth and when you propose a truth what you're doing is you're kind of creating a fiction a detail you're describing like based on you saw all these spooks you saw this scary stuff like dead bodies, skeletons, blood, bloody handprints, whatever you saw. And now you say what you think happened in the room and who it happened to, why it happened. And this is the truth. And essentially is the bride who is contextualizing the thing she just saw. And so there's two different ways to contextualize. You contextualize it as, well, I mean, I know it looks bad, but he didn't actually like bash in his ex-wife uh, head with a candlestick. She fell and knocked the candlestick over and he, he found her that way. And, you know, he loves, he loved her and he didn't murder her. And this is what I think happened here. Or you can be like, Oh, Oh shit. He, mu- he murdered someone here. Um, <laughs> and if you decide that, Oh no, this is a mistake. Like we are mistaking what we're seeing here. This is, this was an accident. This was truly uh, just a bad pitfall to this person who is now my husband. You take a token of faithfulness. And if you're like, oh no, my husband's a murderer, <laughs> then you take <laughs> a token of disloyalty and then you leave that room. And so you you collect these tokens of essentially the bride convincing herself either that, oh no, I am suspicious of my husband and he's scary or contextualizing everything that happens in a way that proves that he's innocent to you and and other you know when you're making an exit move one person makes it but and you're proposing the truth one person makes it but again it's collaborative the sisters can say like i don't think that that's what happened and then they kind of discuss (laughs) or your whole group can be like it's fine and the voice the like intuition in the back of your head who was me the whole time be like bitch no (laughs) this is bad (laughs) <laughs> oh my god, I had so much fun being the 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 the, the, the one point, the one the point of intuition because you know sometimes when you're in a bad situation like you want to convince yourself like yeah. the, your intuition is like bitch no this is bad and the right. rest of you is like it's fine it's fine it's fine she just fell down the stairs it's fine nothing is wrong like yeah, he didn't push her he wasn't <laughs> right. anywhere near he wasn't even home <laughs> there's a perfectly logical explanation for the splatter of brain across the carpet yeah. uh, like. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> The Though, gun went off um, in her hand. Right. Uh, it, our G- we're I'm so, we're sort of making light of it. Our GM yes. went like, do you remember the the classic not classic the cheesy cheesy movie from the late '90s called The Haunting? Yes. <laughs> Where like, uh, it's not terribly scary, but it's like not. the whole thing is about like the house coming alive and attacking yes. people, and I right. love the shit out of that. Yeah. And it did sort of it sort of spooked me in a fun way. I love that sort of like. Mm-hmm. almost mm-hmm. surreal the is, yeah the house is the malicious one yeah yeah uh, that like almost surreal sort of thing and then it ends in a, just a totally gonzo ghost fight at the end like that's that whole thing that that idea is just so my shit but the the gm ran the house being haunted like that ah. as opposed to like every room is a murder scene <laughs> right no yeah i mean and it's it's not just a murder scene it's a haunting right so you may right. see like a woman uh, like a ghost or something along those lines and like trying to figure out what what is this ghost's purpose what it you know like why is she spooking me right now yeah like uh, the, the gm went straight to like true surreal magic like i like this it. this room is physically changing right now because it's so haunted you know like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Which is a different tone than yeah. every every room's a murder scene. Every room's a murder scene. Like I, right. I don't I don't know what the book tells you to do because I don't own it. Or does it not? It does. It gives you some suggestions. And every room is got these great uh so let's see. There's a ground there's a whole the groundskeeper chapter it chapter is maybe longer than like the regular the rest, chapter. The rest of the book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there's something about curating the rooms mm -hmm. and then there's some room threats mm -hmm. uh that are based around like the the thing that could be you know there's four different things body motherhood religion and sexuality right and then there are subsets of those and then there are some moves that the room makes okay and there's lists of them and you know he, like we'll talk about body for a moment this includes the many ways the world tells the women that they are broken and worthless and that their only value is in their appearance. Mm -hmm. Some subsets of body are beauty standards, disability, eating disorders, gender, and illness. Some room moves, things that the room may do to the bride, drug her, perform mm -hmm. a medical procedure, mm -hmm. shame her by introducing a perfect woman, paper the room with what society demands, showcase a flaw for all to see, exhibit consequences of a transgressive woman, Give her the tools she needs to be beautiful. Tempt her with gems, clothes, or delectable delights. Bind her body in satin and silk. Make her hair, teeth, or fingernails fall off. <laughs> so, yes, in, in essence, the rooms themselves are haunted in a way that, you know, while the room is making the move, it could be, you know, there could be a threat or a thing in there that does those things, right? Right. But in a very real way, the rooms themselves are malicious towards right. the bride. Okay, that, so, so 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 hearing that whole list makes a lot of the GM's choices make sense because I believe someone had put on our list of lines and veils because we did all of that like in a chat ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Someone had vetoed the the drugging one, and then I believe mm -hmm. someone else vetoed like self harm. Um, there's yeah there's a in the sexuality list you know there's there's stuff like abortion and things like that so right honestly this is a game that you absolutely 110 percent like it it like describes the x card in the mechanics of the game as an important tool for playing this game mm -hmm. but honestly be, you could go through the room moves and use it as a lines and fails of like i don't ever want a room to do this to me right right like yeah. i just can't and that would, you know, a, a valid way to to go through before you play this game. Yeah, I, we didn't. I mean, like, we obviously were given a link to like the PDF and stuff, but I don't think anybody, at least I didn't, maybe other people did, read through that room list. We just put down stuff that like generally makes us uncomfortable. And so mm -hmm. a couple of those ruled out room moves, but mm -hmm. certainly left plenty to be scary with. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's so much. I mean, there's just so much. And so that moves me on to my other favorite move. Mm -hmm that uh this is a ring move and i know that your game changed it up a little bit yeah but it, it is called shiver from fear and i often like i made this joke to mark whenever he was telling me about it that this this makes this game a larp <laughs> uh, i mean it's already sitting around like a you know it's already a game about sitting around a campfire and telling a ghost story which is in its own way kind of a larp but shiver from fear is when you shiver from fear Name a thing you are most afraid will happen, and the groundskeeper will tell you how it's worse than you feared. <laughs> then you can either keep the ring or path and, and choose uh, like a thing based on that, that fear, or you can pass the ring and only choose one thing. And so as a way, you can pass the ring and move on. And then the shiver from fear is literally you as a player are afraid of what's about to happen. It is when the groundskeeper has described something so creepy that you're like, oh, no, 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 it's about to happen. I'm shivering from fear. <laughs> it's a meta move and it's amazing. Yeah. So I will let's uh, I want to talk about the house rule that we played with for a second mm -hmm. because it was an interesting modification of that rule before we move on to like why I wanted to talk about Bluebeard's Bride so badly. Besides that, it's a good game. But uh, so in our game, the GM so like the, that's a ring move. And so when you have the ring, you're sort of the person who's moving the action forward. You're in the spotlight. Right. And then we'll, mm -hmm. I want to talk about the ring and all that in a little bit. But right. uh, so the GM opened Shiver from Fear to everyone, not just the ring bearer, the ring bearer, which does allow someone else to be like, nope, my turn now. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which is a cool way to like make that pass a little easier. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's the the making that become the way with which you engage with the story and like maybe break the ice and help people buzz in basically to say hey i want to play now is a i think that was a good change yeah especially if you know if the thing that is being described or whatever makes literally someone else who is not the ring bearer like is freaking out right now yeah like letting them describe what they are afraid will happen will then drive the story forward Mm -hmm. and so I, i i do think that that's a good a good house rule you know when you told me about it i was like yeah i could see that yeah like i there's no reason and because it allows you to change like change the ring's hands that is why it is a ring move Mm -hmm. but honestly having that available for anyone to be like i'm freaking out is just great (laughs) yeah and the the gm also specifically told us we we had a conversation about it and the gm also specifically told us one that you didn't necessarily have to be terrified you could also simply be excited that something bad was going to happen. Yes. And if at any point in time you were like, oh, we're so fucked. Like that was when you were supposed yeah. to shiver with fear. Yeah. I mean, and I feel like that's the spirit of that move, right? Is, because you're not is. always literally shivering, but you're right. just going to be like, oh, no. And when it's like, what do you what are you owe knowing about? Like, oh, we're about to open this door and this thing's about to happen. Oh, it sounds like you're shivering from fear because you literally <laughs> did the mechanic of that. Right. right? Yeah. Like, I am afraid this is about to happen, guys, is literally shiver from fear, which is why I like that's such a masterful move. But it it also asks you to be really invested in the game. Yes. You yeah. have to be invested in what's about to happen. Even if you're not scared by it, but you need to be invested in what's about to happen and what's going on to even to even start like pre-thinking that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so that that discussion about like anytime you're like, oh, shit, we're so fucked or or whatever, you have that sort of like, oh, God, feeling was because one of the people and myself included were like, I'm not really the sort of person who gets jumpy like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're probably not going to say something that scares me so badly that I physically react to it. Right. Like. Sure. But we so we talked about it. We were like, no, we'll just don't you, the groundskeeper, guess Mm -hmm. when I'm scared, I will tell you. And so like we we established that as a rule that like people could basically just like buzz in and be like, I'm shivering with fear. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Oh, shit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I think and I think that's a really great, you know, and and when we talk about this being a game and a masterclass of driving a story forward without mechanic, without sorry, without rolling, without random right. randomization, mm-hmm. this is this is probably the number one way that this happens. Now, there are every playbook has a group of like faces, essentially, which is the move that you your your, you know, group move or whatever, or your playbook move, your face move. That's what that's your called. face move. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so there's a couple of different, you know, faces There's three per playbook. And each one is, you know, I'll just read off Animus because it's the first one in the list because alphabetically. It's when you investigate a mysterious object by breaking it, ask a follow-up question about the object. Like, th- that's it. There's no rolling. You, just, you break the object <laughs> because right. you're the Animus mm-hmm. uh, and you're a little fighty maybe. And then you get to ask another question about it. Yep. Right? Yep. And, and so that's that's it. That's the move. And so you're 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 driving the story forward by maybe remove because that now the object is removed and no one else can investigate it. You got your extra question, but now nobody else can ask questions. You know, another one is a shield. When one of your sisters marks trauma, explain to her how the trauma she is experiencing is her fault and <laughs> ask if she believes you. If she believes you, she marks one less trauma. If she rejects your explanation, Mark one trauma as you experience the sh- the shame of your own impotence. <laughs> right? So <laughs> So it's like, hey, I need you to internalize that trauma. Ah, uh, like but it's <laughs> you know, but it's it's such a it's such a great and this is, you know, lots of playbook moves in PBTA kind of kind of work this way where it's very specific. Like when you do this very specific thing, get this very specific result. But these are very geared towards you know understanding trauma and doing this kind of ghost story thing where you you maybe make bad decisions to try to get good results (laughs) right yeah so like yeah 
I want to talk about the ring moves and the maiden moves and mm-hmm. how they got me thinking about like obviously these all these moves are tuned towards telling a specific ghost story. Yeah. yeah. Which got the designer brain turning. <laughs> of course. <laughs> to being like, well, what if we wrote a social system? What if social systems in more traditional games? Because you and you and I both work on some pretty mm-hmm. fucking traditional. traditional games. I sure do. <laughs> sure do. Which like could benefit from learning from creating question askers yes. that direct conversation in a very specific way and don't require rolling. Right. Yeah. So if you're familiar, for listeners, if you're familiar with most PBTA games, there's usually a question asker, like, you know, uh, taking stock of the situation or investigating. They're question askers, but usually you roll, you know, on a hit, you get to ask one. On a 10 plus, you get to ask two. You know, maybe on a miss, you get some bad information. Right. It's, it's often how those are, are formulated. In Bluebeard's Bride, all of those question askers are just, you just fucking ask those questions. Like, right. you do this move, you ask some questions. So let me, let me read our audience, Investigate a Mysterious Object, which is one of the moves that literally anyone can take. Mm-hmm. And so, as we've described, this is a game about parading through this terribly haunted house mm-hmm. and finding these horrible things that are going to scar you permanently. Which, again, I'm making it sound really terrible, and it's not. It's, it's a scary story. It's a scary story. scary stories together. Right, yeah. yeah. So when you investigate a mysterious object from a room, ask two. Period. Ask two. Yep. Period. No rolling. <laughs> no rolling. Yeah. Who's it's actually idea? a colon, but you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, Semantics. <laughs> <laughs> and the questions are, whose item is this? What memory does this item hold? What about this item is odd or uncanny? Why did Bluebeard keep this item? Which are all directly focused towards getting you towards learning that you are in a bad situation. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then it's similarly, take stock. So when you take stock of a tense situation, ask one. And here are the questions that you can ask. Again, no rolling. You just, you take it, you're taking stock. What stalks the bride from the shadows? What traps have been laid for the bride? What does this place demand of the bride? What horror here is hidden from the bride again you could take stock of the situation like in fucking masks that same move is like what here can i use to win the day <laughs> you notice there's none of those kind of questions here because that's not what this game is about right and these kind of question askers are honestly like the bread and butter of what we want to talk about in social systems for yes. other more traditional games right because there's nothing like a traditional game is welcome to concern itself with rolling in in action sequences, I think, because Absolutely. that's where it's, yeah. that's where its DNA is from. All traditional games right. of war game DNA, period. So it's fine if that system is busy yeah. <laughs> fucking around with the dice, but sure the is. social encounters are based on conversations. And yes. I don't think there's anything wrong with taking a lesson from these really directed moves and creating like a question asker that you don't have to roll for i mean rolling is fun so maybe you want some sort of power or something that does roll but like the core system doesn't necessarily need it and that's what that's where i wound up after this tremendous ap also i had nightmares oh so great yeah (laughs) Yeah. that's the mark of a true game right there (laughs) right (laughs) i mean not about the game game, just in general like yeah yeah but it scared you enough to where your brain was like oh what if scary things happened right yeah Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. <A> glowing recommendation. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about why I think traditional games structure social systems the way that they do, mm-hmm. and then expand on how to marry what I think traditional games are trying to get at as to what a game like Bluebeard's Bride is trying to get at. Okay. So, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna use I'm not actually going into the the what is it, game is simulationist. Oh god, don't do that. I, I'm not yeah. going into that. GNS. GNS, yes, that's yeah. what it is. I don't remember I was what the call N stands it, for. I was going to call it GNR, and then I was like, "That's not right." <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not. I'm not going to that. But I am going to say that a lot of traditional games, without a doubt, want to simulate something. Yes, they are trying to simulate a real life experience through through dice, through their mechanics, through whatever. And the deeper, the more traditional a game is, the more it is trying to simulate a real life experience, in my opinion. 
whether it's doing it through narrative tricks or roll dice rolling tricks or whatever else, it is trying to get you to a point where you have simulated what it would be like to be stuck in a dungeon and have to care about food and weight and, you know, carrying capacity and the number of items you can actually physically hold. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, when we talk about that in combat, you know, we realize that we can't actually simulate a real combat because, you know, pe unless we're going outside and hitting each other with sticks, that's not a real true simulation. But we can, you know, try to approximate with dice rolling and random chance and skills and all this kind of stuff until our faces are blue. When we talk about social situations, we come into the problem that that can be simulated without any mechanics whatsoever, right? Players can literally just talk to each other and have a social situation happen. Right. That's the nature of social situations is that they're just all about talking. And you run into a problem with a lot of social situations where when we're trying to simulate what it's like to be in a social situation, we balk at rolling dice and we balk at gamifying it too hard. There, there are a few games that attempt a social combat, a, a literal, <laughs> I mean, a literal social combat. I mean, Exalted Second Edition sure did try. Yeah. And they'll, <laughs> and games will try, right? Like, oh, we'll get into a comfort. And I mean, like I, fucking wrote one like there's one for requiem because i feel like there is an element there of literally having you know a argument with someone and wearing them down and you know getting your points across and and filibustering and all the things that we do naturally in social situations as our characters where our characters may be more eloquent or more skilled at that than we we dweebs could be <laughs> uh, and so you know a lot of a lot of that is the, do we think that players will just take care of this on their own? The answer is some will, absolutely. Some won't because they're just either afraid of it or not very good at it or a myriad of other reasons. And how do we mitigate that to feel like it's, it's really going on, right? And, you know, a, a game like Bluebeard's Bride isn't actually trying to simulate any kind of social situation. It is just trying to get players into a into a mindset of this is spoopy and people don't like you <laughs> and the, the house is against you and the servants don't necessarily trust you and you know all these things and while everything is an investigation slash social situation you're just doing things and so asking these questions to drive the story forward is all very descriptive and it's it's very like it doesn't actually require the players to have a legit conversation with any of the servants or people in the house so but traditional games want you to do that so how do you get to having an actual conversation with the king of the kingdom in which you try to convince him to let your group kill a dragon <laughs> or whatever whatever what, whatever in in that similar like question asking way Right. Right. Because these question askers for social for social system, for an investigation system as well, there's always that like there is a chance of failure. The king may not care, but does there need to be? And I I would posit that no, there doesn't need to be a chance of failure in that situation. There is only the price you have to pay to get what you want. Oh. Ooh. I dig it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh like I like that a lot. That's really good. Because <laughs> I think, right, because I think that a lot of, a lot of times when we think about social situations, they're not, there's not a win-lose situation in that. You not may always. Not, get, not always, right? You may not get what you want, but that doesn't mean you lost. Yeah, I mean, like, the only time I can think of where there is a clear loser in a social interaction is when one party has so much leverage over the other that the mm -hmm. that the subject or the the subject of that leverage cannot really do anything about it and must submit to whatever the person who is blackmailing them or leveraging them so hard is trying to do right and in that that person is a clear loser but like yes. that is a corner case situation well it's a corner case but you also have to think about what got you there right, right. Like, leverage isn't doesn't materialize out of nowhere right it doesn't come from nowhere Right. You either had to have given up stuff to where that person had that kind of leverage over you, which meant you got something before you got into the situation. Right. To have that leverage against you. 
or that person by utilizing that leverage is giving that leverage up. This will probably only work this one time, right? right? In yeah. this way, because now the jig is up. Either you've already used this leverage against me and I am done with you, mm -hmm. right? Like now our social dynamic is cut off completely because you have leveraged me so hard or you've used it up and now you owe me. Right. Right. You know, we, we think about social currencies and social situations when you think about them in real life, there's a, everything is this kind of give and take where it's like, I want you to do something you don't necessarily want to do. And so now I need to convince you, you want to do this thing. And I don't do it by browbeating you. I don't, I mean, I can, but I am giving something up when I do that. I'm either giving up the respect you have for me, or I am giving up, I'm making concessions to you, or I'm promising to do things for you in the future so that I can get you to do the thing I want you to do right now, unless you're already like inclined to do that thing, at which point it's not really like a persuasion. It's just a, hey, you want to go get dinner? Yep, hungry. Like, okay, <laughs> literally that just happens then, right? right? So, you know, I, you know, and I, I don't want to commodify social situations in a game because that can start to feel a little gross, mm -hmm. right? Like, well, I'm just going to hand over some gold and then that will happen for me. Like it has to be like a true risk reward scenario yeah, for it to not feel gross. Yeah, that's fair. I also was thinking about these moves and a more traditional game and how you could create moves like these to simply because sometimes people who play social characters kind of just want to be the person who talks yes and i think you could create basically a core set of these directed conversation questions to funnel to funnel person who just wants to talk into talking about things that are useful right and like I was trying to think about, and I think we'll do this in our, our jam for the extended cut. Yeah. I was trying to think about like what kind of questions would those be as core questions that start important or valuable conversations for the person who just fucking wants to talk. That, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because like what you said, what you were like, what I could see from a system like this is, is both of these things at the same time. Here's a bunch of core questions that simply start important conversations for the player who simply wants to be the person who's chatty. Yeah. And then once you're in other situations where you're like dealing with leverage or intimidation or coercion or like what prices are you willing to pay when it gets right. a little bit more heavy, then you have these other set of questions for mm -hmm. th that type of situation. And so you have this, this like robust set of core things for your social situation that kind of cover all that ground and you don't really need to randomize any of it. <laughs> in fact randomizing it could lead to a feeling where people feel incapable or yeah. bad about the situation where it's like well i made such a rousing speech and then i had to roll right i can't tell you how many times i've played a charisma based D, D character only to roll a one on uh, and fail a check on something where i was like literally i said everything they wanted to hear like <laughs> yeah, and that's interesting because, you know, when you think about that, about certain skill sets and the, and the chance of failure, right, mm -hmm. you're always bound to find somebody who you rub the wrong way, right, or that just doesn't, isn't susceptible to your charms. Mm -hmm. But as a person who talks a lot, <laughs> and makes friends easily, right, I really do. Mm hmm. You know, not everybody loves me. I'm not going to try to pretend that that's true. <laughs> um, and I probably am very off-putting to certain people, which is very real because I'm loud. And, you know, if you don't like loud people, you probably don't like me. Um, <laughs> but I, I find that it's very, it's very rare. Well, I will go into a situation and I will say, like, here's a reasonable thing. Here's a thing that I know you want or that I know will please you. And, you know, I am presenting my case to you and they're just like cold, like hard no, big pass, like buzz off because that's just not the way people work, right? If, if I am being presented with something I am interested in mildly by someone who I'm just like okay with, mm -hmm. and, but they've got all the right things, I'm going to entertain their proposition. Like I just am because that's how people work. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. It's true. 
so having like the the hard failure, the big, you know, like the strong no pass on whatever it is you're trying to do is like not a accurate simulation in any way, shape or form, which then means that, you know, like, do we care about simulation or do we care about, you know, rolling dice? <laughs> you know, that is the question, isn't it? I mean, I like rolling dice. I Don't also like rolling dice. For, for heaven's sake, I'm in charge of an exalt <laughs> more than one exalted book. I certainly have strong feelings about rolling dice. Yeah, and Same. how how good rolling dice can feel, and especially yeah. how good rolling a lot of dice can feel. That's yeah. not what we're talking about right no. now. <laughs> no, and you know, and and what I like to think about because I'm I'm really bad at rolling dice. I am I'm the the queen of beefing my rolls. Uh, <laughs> Beefs the fucking roll. Yeah, I, I, just beefing rolls. Um, <laughs> and so I tr I like to play games that have mechanics that mitigate my my success and failure that don't depend depend completely on a random roll. You know, if I'm playing a war game, I will play the th I will pick the thing that either gives me you know more more success chance on my dice so that they are less likely to fail me. Mm -hmm. Or I will pick the thing that has a guaranteed effect. Yeah. Because this is the way I ensure that even if it's not as powerful, well, it's better than just missing completely. Right. Because failing sucks and it hurts and I don't like it. Um, and I do it often enough to where I'm very familiar with it <laughs> as a concept, <laughs> as, a, as a part of my life. And, you know, I've learned from it, which the thing I've learned from failure is that I don't like it. Uh, <laughs> Not like I think anybody out there is like, oh, I love to fail. Uh, I just I love to try and then have it amount to nothing. <laughs> like, it's my it's my kink. Like, OK, that's fine. But also, you know, so I think social situations are one of those things where people, you know, people find frustration in social situations because they do fail. There is failure in social situations, but the, the way failure looks in a social situation isn't the same as the way failure looks in uh well, i mean it is a little but we don't simulate it the same right right it's kind of how it looks whenever you fail a combat right you don't just die because you failed a combat right you you may have made strides you may have injured the other opponent you may have made some inroads you just didn't overall get what you wanted out of it and that's right. kind of how social situations work too pretty much so i don't i don't know why we don't just make social combat the exact same as physical combat but we don't i feel like it's because there's a like a mental disconnect between the two like people think that those two things are different and they are but mechanically they aren't yeah i mean i'm not gonna wave a sword at you and say like do what i want but like if i do you I may mean, still do what i want <laughs> uh. i mean don't threaten me with a good time uh <laughs> <laughs> and now i've broken monica thanks so, <laughs> in case you didn't know monica the thirsty sword lesbian <laughs> this is how you break her <laughs> so anyway we're at like an hour was there anything else that we wanted to discuss before we do our our bonus segment for our patrons i don't i don't think so i mean i think we've covered kind of the way we you know the way we feel about this and and i don't know that we were actually trying to come to any kind of like consensus no. or conclusion on this I think so we much as talk just kind of kind of talk about how how we feel about social interactions and, and how we can learn from uh you know you can always learn from any game in fact oh, yeah. you should be reading you should, every game. you should learn from every game you read yeah even if the game's not good just read fucking read it but this game is phenomenal yeah. and therefore worth taking lessons from so I don't I can't remember if I've ever said this on on BXP before, but um, once at a con, I got to go sit in on a panel and listen to Rebecca Sugar talk about writing, mm. which was really Good cool. Stuff. Yeah, really cool. And one of the things they said was whenever they're stuck and trying to, like, get the creative juices flowing, they watch a bad movie because a good movie would just make them wish they had made it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but. <laughs> Even bad movies have things in them that are good. Mm -hmm. And then you, you can be inspired by the like little nugget of something good in the bad movie. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And I was like, that's so, that's so good. That's so like gracious. There's something like really gracious about that. 
And I feel that way about games, too, that like, if I read a good game, I just wish I'd made it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know. Like, oh, I could just I could just hack this whole thing and, and just make right. this game as opposed to like taking a small bit of it and iterating on it. Yeah. No, anyway, that's a good idea. Wis- wisdom from Rebecca Sugar. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bless. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, so I guess you know this opens a conversation. So, if your listeners want to get on Discord, yeah, and continue talking about social systems, I'm willing to keep having this conversation because I think it's a it's a thing. You know, it's a it's a noodle. Right. It's not a it's not a we've come to a conclusion. No, this right? is a noodle. It's, a, it's a definitely a noodle. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, let's let's noodle out a system. All right. For bonus content. Yeah. If you aren't already a patron, you can look us up on Patreon and drop us a buck and then you can find out what we were going to talk about because we release extended cuts of all our episodes. You can also hang out with us in the secret room on our discord. Secret room. Uh, Just to throw in before we close that bonus experience is part of the misdirected mark network. Can you can you bing for me, please? Bing. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) And. Don't forget that BXP is sponsored by Nerdy Kepi, which has all kinds of really cool pride swag, including cool ass masks. And now uh, dresses with pockets. Dresses with pockets. Uh, and wonderfully loud button down shirts. Oh my God, they're so good. Yeah. <laughs> so if that appeals to you, you should totally go buy some stuff. Oh, I also have a pair of like cool Doc Martin style boots that have the buy pride flag and a floral print on them. They're really yeah. fucking cool. Can I get compliments on them from literally everyone when I wear them? Right, because they're like, they don't realize that they're complimenting the gay. They're yes. tricking everyone it's, into it, loving gay. Right. It's <laughs> it does it's very hard to tell that it is the pride flag colors unless you know they are the pride flag colors. They're just really cool, pretty floral boots otherwise. Uh-huh. Um and literally people on the street are like, Your boots are so fucking cool <laughs> when I wear them out. Um, Amazing. Yeah, so that's nerdykeppy.com, and if you use promo code BXPCAST at checkout, you'll get 10% off your order. Please support a small-owned queer business and us. Yes. Uh, Danielle, where can they find you if they want to hear you talk about more things? I am all over the internet, but you can find my website at daniellelozon.com. You can also find me on Twitter at Impernius, and you can find me on Facebook. Don't find me on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> nothing but bad takes on facebook i also hang out in the bxp discord i also hang out in the onyx path publishing discord i hang out on discord probably more than is healthy for me <laughs> that's a quarantine mood it's oh god <laughs> yeah, you can find me on twitter at zenith sun you can also find me as sister death machine on all of those other twitters uh, twitters discords Fuck. discords discords <laughs> I'm around on the internet. I don't have a website for myself yet, but I probably should. But that's a di- that's a task for when I have more spoons. So, <laughs> or you could be like me and just pay someone to do it for you. I could, you know, I could do that. That's a pretty good idea. But anyway, remember to change it if you want to. Yeah. Do I have to do this? Ugh, fine. Bonus Experience is written and produced by Monica and Ray. And edited by Margaret. Our logo and art is by Nino Studios. Find her on Facebook and Instagram. Our theme song is Reuse Noise with the Light by CDK. And is used under the Attribution Non-Commercial Creative Commons license. BXP is part of the Misdirected Mart Network. Uh, I'm not reading this. Fuck it. Bye.